Hello there, I'm, I'm Lloyd Evans, Evans. welcome you're to the Bunker, the it's time Channel for another voicemail. Today's voicemail is from me an anonymous caller, let's quite listen quite to what they have to say. Have my heating up and running just yet, I've jumped in front of the Hi, camera Lloyd. because um, feel free to I really use need this. to talk about this article in the Moscow Times, it's just gone up three hours. A young woman raised as a Jehovah's Witness who says she was molested by a fellow church member and that the church had been protecting pedophiles within their midst. Think about the apostate-driven lies and dishonesties that Jehovah's organization is permissive toward pedophiles. I mean, that is ridiculous, isn't it? The Watchtower have fostered a policy of silence on child abusers. Do not reveal the confidential talk of another. An investigation into child sexual abuse among Jehovah's Witnesses and accusations that religious leaders led a cover up within some of the group's 14,000 U.S. congregations. Born and brought up as a Jehovah's Witness, the church was the family's life. And so, when the abuse began, it was to the church they turned. But within the congregation, ours is a spiritual protection. When we're talking about physical protection, that's up to the secular authorities to provide. Um, when I was a little girl, like probably about six or seven, Jonathan Kendrick uh, abused me. She blames the Watchtower's secrecy for enabling Kendrick to marry into her family and target her. My name is Lloyd Evans, and in this special video for my John Cedars channel, I will be answering the question, Jehovah's Witnesses and child abuse, is there a problem? It could be that you are one of Jehovah's Witnesses and you're understandably concerned about the negative media on this subject. Or you could have very little to do with the Witnesses, but you still want to know whether the media reports are justified. Let me start by saying that the mishandling of child sexual abuse is a problem for many organisations and it is now becoming increasingly obvious that Jehovah's Witnesses are by no means immune. A member of the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses, Jeffrey Jackson, even admitted this when giving evidence in 2015 before a royal commission in Australia. Now, do you recognise, Mr Jackson, and in asking this question, let me make it clear, I'm not suggesting it's peculiar to the Jehovah's Witness organisation, there are many, many organisations in this position, but do you accept that the Jehovah's Witness organization has a problem with child abuse amongst its members? I accept that child abuse is a problem right throughout the community and it's something that we've had to deal with as well. And do you accept that it's presented, I withdraw that, do you accept that the manner in which your organization has dealt with allegations of child sexual abuse uh, has also presented problems? Uh, there have been changes in policies over the last 20 or 30 years where we've tried to address uh, some of those uh, uh, problem areas and by the fact that we've changed the policy would indicate that the original policies weren't perfect. And you accept, of course, that your organisation, including people in positions of responsibility like elders, are not immune from the problem of child sexual abuse. Uh, that appears to be the case. So, it's clear that at least at some level, Jehovah's Witnesses have a problem with child abuse. This raises the following questions. What is the cause of this problem? How long have we known that there is a problem? Are there any specific cases to help us identify the problem? What is the response of the governing body? And how does this affect the public? We will begin with tackling the first question. What is the cause of this problem? In other words, what specific reasons account for the prevalence of child abuse among Jehovah's Witnesses? This is a complicated question, but I believe there are five main contributing factors. Firstly, there's the two-witness rule. Jehovah's Witness elders are instructed in their manual, the Shepherd the Flock of God book, that anyone who accuses another of wrongdoing must have another witness. 
This rule is to be applied even in cases of child abuse where, for obvious reasons, there is rarely a bystander watching the abuse take place. Accordingly, pages 72 and 73 of the Elder's Manual contain the following guidance. If the accuser or the accused is unwilling to meet with the elders, or if the accused continues to deny the accusation of a single witness and the wrongdoing is not established, the elders will leave matters in Jehovah's hands. The investigating elders should compose a record, sign it, put it in a sealed envelope, and place it in the congregation's confidential file. Additional evidence may later come to light to establish matters. Elders can therefore only take an accusation of child abuse seriously if the molester admits to his actions, or someone else other than the victim saw him do it. Now it doesn't take a genius to understand that not all pedophiles are anxious to admit to their crimes. And it's extremely unlikely that they will prey on children in front of spectators who can later act as witnesses. The only exception to the two-witness rule is a loophole referred to by some as the two-victim rule. Basically, if another victim of the same abuser comes forward, his or her evidence can be counted as the second witness. The obvious problem with this rule is that it leaves a child molester free to abuse a second child before being brought to justice. It also relegates the harrowing, life-altering ordeal of either the first or second victim as being little more than part of an evidence-gathering process. It would be the same as saying of an accused murderer, we'll know if he really is a murderer if we let him loose and he murders someone else. The second aggravating factor is Watchtower's obsession with secrecy. These days, more progressive organisations value the respect and credibility that comes with openness and transparency and letting the public know how responsible they can be when problems arise. But Watchtower isn't like that. Watchtower has long prized secrecy and confidentiality. In a letter dated July 1st, 1989, Watchtower gave the following guidance to elders. Elders share the obligation to shepherd the flock. However, they must be careful not to divulge information about personal matters to unauthorized persons. There is a time to keep quiet when your words should prove to be few. Proverbs 10.19 warns, In the abundance of words there does not fail to be transgression, but the one keeping his lips in check is acting discreetly. Problems are created when elders unwisely reveal matters that should be kept confidential. Elders must give special heed to the counsel, do not reveal the confidential talk of another. Often the peace, unity, and spiritual well-being of the congregation are at stake. Improper use of the tongue by an elder can result in serious legal problems for the individual, the congregation, and even the society. In a more recent letter to elders dated November 6th, 2014, the organization went as far as to say that if elders are judicially investigating a wrongdoing that is also a crime, they should keep it secret. In some cases, the elders will form a judicial committee to handle alleged wrongdoing that may also constitute a violation of criminal law for example, murder, rape, child abuse, fraud, theft, or assault. Generally, the elders should not delay the Judicial Committee process, but strict confidentiality must be maintained to avoid unnecessary entanglement with secular authorities who may be conducting a criminal investigation of the matter. For example, even the fact that a judicial committee has been formed should not be disclosed to persons not entitled to know. To help maintain its secrecy, Watchtower is adamant that it will only report accusations of child abuse to the authorities if the local laws in the country or state specifically require elders to do this. You might be thinking, well, that's perfectly reasonable. So long as no laws are broken, what's the harm in not reporting somebody else's crime? But think about what that means for a moment. 
Imagine you went on holiday for two weeks and when you returned you found your house had been broken into. Thieves had taken some irreplaceable family heirlooms. Because you were away when the thieves struck, you would have no clue as to their identity. Then you remember that your neighbour has a closed circuit camera system capable of reading licence plates. So you call your neighbour and ask to review his footage for clues. But your neighbour says, no, the footage belongs to him, it's his private property and he isn't required by law to show it to anyone. He refuses to help you get your things back or help bring justice to those who broke into your home. That's essentially the attitude Watchtower is displaying every time it refuses to report the hideous crime of child molestation to law enforcement. Only instead of a person's house and belongings being violated, we are talking about a child being robbed of its mental and emotional well-being, leaving it permanently damaged. Just because someone is not legally obliged to do something doesn't mean they're not morally obliged to do the right thing. A third factor is the separation of Jehovah's Witnesses from the world in general. When discussing secular society, Watchtower publications hardly foster a healthy attitude about the world outside the organisation. As the May 15th, 2014 Watchtower put it, Satan's system of things will soon come to its end, but God's organization will survive the last days. Or, if you prefer the January 1st, 1990 Watchtower, It may not be too long, but we must endure. In Satan's system, we have to put up a hard fight for the faith, as the world's immorality, corruption, and hatreds surround us on all sides. This siege mentality can and does translate into a feeling that all problems between Jehovah's Witnesses should be sorted out internally with the help of the elders. After all, why would you want to involve the police or courts of law when these are all elements of Satan's doomed system that are soon to be destroyed? The police are there to protect you from otherworldly people, not from fellow believers in your spiritual paradise. This aversion to taking legal action against fellow believers was perfectly summed up in the March 15th, 1996 Watchtower on page 15. Loyalty to Jehovah God will also keep us from doing anything that would bring reproach upon His name and kingdom. For example, two Christians once got into such difficulty with each other that they improperly resorted to a worldly law court. The judge asked, are both of you Jehovah's Witnesses? Evidently, he could not understand what they were doing in court. What a reproach that was. Loyalty to Jehovah God would have caused those brothers to heed the counsel of the Apostle Paul. Really, then, it means altogether a defeat for you that you are having lawsuits with one another. Why do you not rather let yourselves be wronged? Why do you not rather let yourselves be defrauded? Certainly the course of loyalty to Jehovah God is to suffer personal loss rather than to bring reproach upon Jehovah and his organization. So, rightly or wrongly, at least in the mind of a Jehovah's Witness, suffering personal injury will often be of lesser concern compared to the unthinkable prospect of bringing Jehovah's organization into reproach. And as a fourth problem, we have misconceptions surrounding forgiveness. Like many evangelical denominations, Jehovah's Witnesses teach that any sin, no matter how serious, can be forgiven. But how far should this go when it comes to pedophilia? For example, should someone who molests children be forgiven to the extent that he's appointed to a position of trust within a church or congregation? Should it be possible for a pedophile to serve as an elder? As recently as October 2012, Watchtower sent out a letter to all elders that essentially said, yes. It cannot be said in every case that one who has sexually abused a child could never qualify for privileges of service in the congregation. That same letter told elders that notoriety was a key factor in deciding whether a pedophile could serve as an elder or not. If nobody in the congregation knew about that person's history, then the pedophile could be deemed irreprehensible or free from accusation 
and therefore fit for appointment. But this reasoning overlooks the very nature of child abuse, namely the fact that it is carried out in secret, behind closed doors, away from the public gaze. A congregation cannot be aware of a child molester if there are policies in place specifically designed to keep them in the dark. And the fact that they're unaware of a pedophile's crimes doesn't make that pedophile suitable elders material. Also, by allowing pedophiles the potential to serve as elders as a means of extending forgiveness, Watchtower is seriously overlooking the very nature of pedophilia. It isn't something that just comes and goes, or can be banished by prayer, confessions and religious counselling. Small progress is being made in rehabilitation techniques, but it is being made by skilled professionals with years of experience in working with offenders, and even they will admit that some pedophiles simply cannot be rehabilitated. Forgiveness of pedophiles on religious grounds is therefore an entirely misguided concept, especially when used to justify allowing child molesters to assume positions of trust. I'm sorry, but if you've raped a child, you don't get to run for political office, you don't get to work as a teacher or family doctor, and you don't get to be any kind of responsible church leader, ever. Get used to it. Finally, there is a problem that eclipses and influences all of these previous four factors. I'm referring to the perception among witnesses that child abuse is first and foremost a sin and only a crime by coincidence. This flawed thinking, in my view, overshadows everything. For example, if the governing body were to consider child abuse as a crime in the same way as murder is a crime, they wouldn't insist on having two witnesses or two victims of the same perpetrator. They would tell elders to make sure all victims go to the police straight away and let justice take its course. Also, if the governing body took child abuse seriously as a crime as it does murder, it would be more concerned with protecting vulnerable ones in the congregations than with preserving confidentiality and shielding the reputation of the organisation. If parents viewed child abuse as a crime in the same way as murder, then they wouldn't think twice about pursuing justice against a perpetrator regardless of whether he or she happened to share the same religious views. And as regards forgiveness... It should be obvious that a man who rapes a child is just as undesirable for a position of trust in a congregation as someone who has been convicted for murder or theft. Hence, most of the problems surrounding child abuse could easily be fixed if the governing body were to embrace the mantra, let the Bible judge sin, but let the law judge crime. But, because in their minds the sinfulness of child abuse outweighs everything else, this can and does lead to child abusers being sheltered from justice. Interestingly, as a side note, despite there being numerous rules in the Jewish law code against a variety of intimate acts, including prohibitions related to menstruation, wet dreams and incest, nowhere in the Hebrew or Greek scriptures does it expressly state that it is wrong for an adult to have sex with a child. Arguably, the strong revulsion of most people to pedophilia has more to do with our innate sense of right and wrong than the commands of any sacred text. Now we've examined the reasons why Jehovah's Witnesses have a problem with child abuse, we can ask ourselves the question, how long have we known about it? I wish I could tell you that the public has been alert to the institutional mishandling of child sex abuse for decades. But the simple truth is that as of 2016, which is the year in which I'm making this video, public concern in this area is still a relatively recent phenomenon. In the United States, it wasn't until 1986 that Congress passed the first laws aimed at giving victims of child sex abuse the right to make a civil claim. In other words, to make organisations accountable for abuse perpetrated by individuals. Ten years later, in 1996, Megan's Law was enacted, giving American citizens the right to know the details of sex offenders right across the country. From now on, every state in the country will be required by law to tell a community when a dangerous sexual predator enters its midst. We respect people's rights, 
But today, America proclaims there is no greater right than a parent's right to raise a child in safety and love. Today, America warns, if you dare to prey on our children, the law will follow you wherever you go, state to state, town to town. A similar provision, known as the Child Sex Offender Disclosure Scheme, or Sarah's Law, was rolled out in parts of the UK as recently as 2011. With legislation came increased prosecution and detection of cases. By the dawn of the 21st century, old stigmas and taboos had been sufficiently swept aside for the media to take a more active role in raising awareness and the Catholic Church was among the first institutions to be investigated. The 2015 Oscar-nominated movie Spotlight documents the superb efforts and professionalism of investigative journalists who in 2001 and 2002 exposed widespread child abuse by Catholic priests in the Boston area. If you haven't watched it already, please do check it out. It was also in 2002 that two hard-hitting documentaries were released that focused attention on the covering up of child abuse by Jehovah's Witnesses. There was an NBC Dateline programme titled Witness for the Prosecution. Tonight on Dateline, they've taken on the most powerful force in their lives, their own church, exposing what they say is a terrible evil. I didn't know any better. I just remember the hurt child molestation. There was also a BBC Panorama program titled Suffer the Little Children. Over 6,000 Jehovah's Witnesses are in town for their district convention. Panorama is here too. We're looking for answers from the leaders of an organization that's under fire, facing mounting allegations that it's shielding abusers silencing victims and putting children at risk. The Panorama documentary aired in the UK on July 14th, 2002, which was a Sunday. I can vividly remember that morning being in a Kingdom Hall in North Wales where I was away for the weekend with some friends. After the meeting, an elder stood on the platform and read a letter to the congregation. That same letter was read out at every congregation in the UK. It said, in part, in recent weeks, the press in this country has focused attention on the way accusations of child abuse are handled by various religious organizations. Such reports may cause some sincere individuals to ask about the procedures followed by Jehovah's Witnesses. Therefore, we believe that it will be beneficial to review with you our Bible-based position so that you will know how you ought to give an answer to any who may inquire. Simply stated, we abhor the sexual abuse of children and will not protect any perpetrator of such repugnant acts from the consequences of his gross sin. We expect the elders to investigate every allegation of child abuse. Even one abused child is one too many. However, in evaluating the evidence, they must bear in mind the Bible's clear direction no single witness should rise up against a man respecting any error or any sin. At the mouth of two witnesses, or at the mouth of three witnesses, the matter should stand good. Everyone knew that this letter was intended to prepare us for a documentary being shown on TV that same evening, a panorama program. I returned home and watched it with my dad and sister. The programme showed a persistent and tenacious BBC reporter, Betsam Powies, speaking to numerous victims of child sexual abuse, both in Britain and the United States. As each victim told their dreadful story, a pattern emerged of horrendous abuse going ignored by elders, of victims ordered to stay silent, of police having their investigations disrupted, of witnesses siding with the perpetrator rather than the victim and of an organisation that simply refused to grasp its urgent duty to protect children. Even though I found the programme disturbing, I still felt an overwhelming need to show loyalty to the organisation, no matter what. I even recall arguing with my sister, who back then was braver than I was in questioning Watchtower. 
I pleaded with her, no, you don't understand. All these people who molested children have since been dealt with. These are just a few bad individuals. They've been disfellowshipped or they're no longer serving as elders. It's all been sorted out. Because I was raised as a witness and I was desperate to think of Watchtower as God's clean, pure organisation, I refused to accept that there was anything wrong. But nine years later, when I finally began to awaken from years of indoctrination, I realised there really was a serious problem. Thanks to the two witness rule and other factors, countless witness children were, and still are, being needlessly exposed to sick, evil people. Rather than viewing any abused child as one too many, to this day, Watchtower continues to let thousands of known pedophiles go unreported. The question is, how many thousands? In the Panorama programme, a former elder named Bill Bowen was quite specific in telling Betsam Powies the number of unreported pedophiles on Watchtower's database. How many names do you suspect are on that list? 23,720. How do you know that? I was contacted by sources within the church. I was given a figure of over 20,000. Two different sources came back to me and said that number is actually more specific and gave me a figure of 23,720. They, they told me that they had accessed the internal database and that figure was based on child molesters in the USA, Canada and Europe. And that's the figure that they were given. The film later shows Betsam Powies, armed with this information, confronting a now deceased member of the governing body, Theodore Jarras, who was less than cooperative. So it was back to America and back to a Jehovah's Witness convention in Tulsa. We'd been told we'd find a member of the governing body here. Ted Jarrett's is one of the men responsible for the church's child protection policy. For more than two months, we've been asking them for an interview. We want answers to some simple questions. Why do they keep their database of suspected paedophiles secret? Why don't they report all allegations of abuse to the police? Why do they send children back to the arms of their abusers? They'd refuse to talk to us, but here at last, we had our chance. Tell me about the database. How do you justify keeping a list of people, men in some cases, who have confessed to paedophilia, but you have not reported them to the authority? What justification is there for you to keep that list? You have a privacy law. You have a directive from the European Union. You observe that, don't you? So when allegations well, of abuse are made, it's all right to keep them private? I think you were answered. That question was answered to your, should be to your satisfaction. Can you answer it now? I'm not going to repeat. I'll just tell you exactly that you can go and you see it in writing. It's all in fact. You know, the Bible says, do not go beyond the things that are written. We don't go beyond the things that are written. And that was that. So, is the database real or not? In a fax sent to the BBC on May 9th, 2002, two months before Panorama aired, Watchtower admitted to its existence, but the numbers cited by Bowen were disputed. You have been told that here in the United States, we have compiled a list of 23,720 names of child abusers. That is false. First of all, the total number of names in our records is considerably lower than that. In addition, it is not meaningful to focus on the number of names we have in our records. This is because our figures include the names of many persons who have only been accused of child abuse, whereas the charges have not been substantiated. Though to this day nobody outside Watchtower knows how many alleged child molesters are on the organisation's database, the fact that the database exists and is currently sitting safely on Watchtower's hard drives is beyond doubt. Later in this video I will be showing you further proof of its existence and a recent insight into just how many names it may be concealing. So, how long have we known about this problem? Ex-Jehovah's Witnesses like Bill Bowen and Barb Randerson have been speaking out about it openly since about 
Barbara Anderson used to work in Watchtower's writing department, and her excellent website, watchtowerdocuments.org, tells of how she first learned about the child abuse problem while working at Bethel headquarters in 1992. What she discovered led to her leaving the organisation in 1998 and starting her activism work shortly thereafter. But certainly prior to the 1990s, we don't know of anyone inside or outside the organisation who knew there was a significant problem with child sex abuse, let alone how bad it was. Only with fairly recent improvements in legislation and growing media scrutiny could the full scope of the problem begin to be realised. And in many ways we're still just scratching the surface in our understanding. For every case we learn about, it's reasonable to assume that there are many, many more. This brings us to our third question. What specific cases do we know about? There are countless publicised cases from which to choose. In fact, news stories about new victims are presently popping up faster than I can keep track of them. But for the purpose of this video, I will focus on six victims whose cases have propelled the mishandling of child abuse by Jehovah's Witnesses into the spotlight. Two of these victims are from the United States, Candace Conti and Jose Lopez. A further two are from the United Kingdom, Karen Morgan from South Wales, and a victim we will refer to as Amelia. And for privacy reasons, our last two victims are known only as BCB and BCG. Both are from Australia. We'll start with Candace Conti. In June 2012, Conti was awarded $28 million in damages by a jury in California for the abuse she suffered at the hands of a Jehovah's Witness named Jonathan Kendrick between 1995 and 1996, when she was 9 and 10 years old. Watchtower was found responsible because prior to Conti's abuse, Kendrick's elders knew that he had molested his stepdaughter, but they did nothing to prevent him from moving on to other children. All they did was remove him as a ministerial servant. They even allowed Kendrick to pair off with Conti in the preaching work. In this report for ABC News, Candace Conti describes her ordeal. Do you remember your first impression of Jonathan Kendrick? He's just a big person. found him very scary. When Candace was nine years old, she says she was abused by a well-liked member of her small congregation in Fremont, California. While door-to-door -door evangelizing, which Candace would often do without her parents, she says Jonathan Kendrick began taking her to his house and molesting her. I don't really want to go into everything else because I don't have nightmares. <laughs> right. Understood. She testified that he abused her several times a month for what she says felt like two years. When you were a kid, why did you feel like you couldn't come forward? Bringing that up just would demolish the only people that I knew. I think I was scared too. After the verdict was announced, a lengthy appeal process ensued in which Watchtower tried to get the judgment reversed. And they partially succeeded. Courtroom footage filmed by Reveal and the Centre for Investigative Reporting appeared on PBS and ABC News. It showed Watchtower's lawyers making their defence. Members of the North Fremont Congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses abhor child abuse of any form. The Jehovah's Witnesses are not a youth group. The elders did their job spiritually, and I think that's all we can ask of these men. Thank you. The appeals court determined that Watchtower's leadership had no legal duty to warn parents in Conti's congregation that a confessed child molester had access to their children. The court removed the punitive part of the verdict, but still insisted Conti received $2.8 million in compensation. It was decided that whether there was a legal duty to protect children or not, Conti's elders had still paired a nine-year-old girl with a pedophile in the preaching work, which was considered a church-sponsored activity. Not long after the appeal verdict was announced, the case was settled. Despite ending in something of an anticlimax, the Candace Conti case will go down in history as groundbreaking. It was, after all, the first time a jury had ruled against Watchtower in a child sex abuse case. And by bravely going public with her story,
Conti inspired a flood of other victims to step forward and pursue justice. One such victim was Jose Lopez. Lopez had been one of eight children abused by a witness named Gonzalo Campos between 1982 and 1995 in the San Diego area. Elders knew Campos was a child molester as early as 1982, but took no action. Instead, even while Campos was accumulating more victims, they rewarded him with congregational privileges, first by making him a ministerial servant in 1988, and then by appointing him as an elder in 1993. It wasn't until 1995 that Campos was finally disfellowshipped, but by 2000 he managed to get reinstated. In 2009, Campos' victims learned that he was regularly attending meetings and began pursuing legal action. Soon after, in 2010, Campos fled to Mexico, where he has remained ever since. Though Campos managed to slip through the fingers of justice, the organisation that had for so long concealed his crimes was less fortunate. In February 2013, one of the victims, Jose Lopez, filed suit against Watchtower for his abuse, after his fellow victims each received a substantial settlement from the organisation, believed to be millions of dollars in total. Lopez won the case and was awarded $13.5 million in damages. The story was covered in this news report. It took a San Diego man 30 years to finally talk about the abuse that happened at this church. The fact that he was just given $13.5 million didn't make it any easier. It's been very hard on me. Those are the first words 36-year-old Jose Lopez has spoken publicly about what happened to him in 1986. It's never going to be over. This man, Gonzalo Campos, was an elder teaching Bible study at the Kingdom Hall of Jehovah's Witnesses when he started abusing a then six-year-old Jose Lopez. I did abuse him. That video deposition was obtained by Team 10 last year. It helped convince a judge to award Lopez $13.5 million. Ordered to pay the Watchtower. The interesting thing about this case is that Watchtower lost, at least in part, because they refused to cooperate with the requests of the court, leaving the judge no choice but to rule against them by default. So, what requests did Watchtower refuse? This brings us back to what we were saying earlier about the secret database. Lopez's legal team successfully argued that the database was itself a key piece of evidence in demonstrating Watchtower's failure to report child molesters. Trey Bundy, an investigative reporter for Reveal, describes what happened next in this interview with the Huffington Post. Uh, and talk to us, you know, I, I don't know if we have time to go into some of the specific cases, but maybe we'll just bring up uh, Jose Lopez. Uh, uh, that's what we have time for now. He was molested when he was seven years old by a Jehovah's Witness congregant in San Diego. And a judge awarded him $13.5 million when his case against the witnesses concluded in October. Uh, but, you know, how in particular was this lawsuit really able to shed light on the religion's database of predators? This was a really important suit. And, and one of the reasons is because it, it resulted in, in what looks like a really rare admission. You had a Watchtower official testifying in the case that since 1997, they've directed all bodies of elders across the United States to report to the Watchtower any known child abusers. The Watchtower has been gathering this information for almost 20 years now, and, and the information is very detailed. It's who's, who, what's the person's name? How old was the victim? Uh, does anybody else know about this? So uh, Erwin Zalkin, the attorney for Jose Lopez in San Diego, subpoenaed this, this database. The Watchtower official, a man named Richard Ash, said that the, there was so much information and it was mixed up in so many millions of documents and so many, uh, more than 14,000 uh, computer files that it would take years for them to produce that information, to extract the data on all, all they know about child sex abusers. Uh, Zalkin brought in a software expert who testified they should be able to do it in less than two months. And at that point, the Watchtower essentially said, we're not going to provide this. Uh, as a result, the judge uh, threw the Watchtower's defense out of court and uh, issued a default judgment, uh, $13.5 million. Well, certainly uh, incredibly, incredibly disturbing stuff. Trey, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. But refusing a court order to produce its database wasn't the only thing Watchtower was punished for. 
It also refused a subpoena for the appearance of its most senior governing body member, Gerrit Loesch. In his desperation to get out of appearing on the stand, Loesch sent a statement in which he emphatically argued against having any involvement with Watchtower's child abuse policy. He said, I am not and never have been a corporate officer, director, managing agent, member or employee of Watchtower. I do not direct and have never directed the day-to-day -day operations of Watchtower. I do not answer to Watchtower. I do not have and never have had any authority as an individual to make or determine corporate policy for Watchtower or any department of Watchtower. Watchtower does not have and never has had any authority over me. Goodness knows what would happen if an ordinary Jehovah's Witness stood up and said words similar to that in a congregation meeting. Needless to say, the court didn't buy it and they ruled against Watchtower accordingly. After the trial was over, Lopez's lawyer Erwin Zolkin was interviewed on JW Podcast, which is a show hosted by a mix of former and inactive Jehovah's Witnesses, including myself. During our interview, I will never forget Zolkin relating a chilling exchange he had with one of Watchtower's lawyers. My, our goal is not to destroy the Jehovah's Witnesses. No. They no, may no. think that's what we're after. We are really after trying to get them to change what are really just antiquated and dangerous policies. And when we resolve our first few cases with them, one of the things I asked their lawyers, and, 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 and Mario Moreno in particular, was what can we do to change this so that this doesn't keep happening? Think, yeah. And he looked at me and said, we're never changing this. I said, oh well, we'll God. see about so, at least according to Mario Moreno, the governing body is in no mood to learn its lessons, despite multiple courtroom defeats, a barrage of negative media exposure, and millions of dollars in settlements. We now switch our focus from the USA to the UK for our next two cases. Karen Morgan was around 12 years old when she began being abused by her uncle, Mark Sewell, who was then a ministerial servant. Sewell started kissing her on the lips and progressed to arranging situations for them to be alone so he could kiss her with his tongue. Sewell would also get Karen to lie on top of him and would caress her back while in his underwear. Halfway through his abuse of Karen, Sewell was appointed an elder. When Karen finally told her parents, they took her to confront Sewell and he accused her of lying. More meetings with elders followed, but far from being productive, these only made things worse, as Karen was repeatedly made to confront her abuser. Finally, a seven-man committee of elders was appointed by the London branch, and Sewell was stripped of his position as an elder and disfellowshipped. But he was disfellowshipped not for his abuse of Karen, but for having a belligerent and unforgiving attitude. Years later, after more of Sewell's victims came forward, he was arrested by police and put on trial. By that time, he had been reinstated as a witness. Jehovah's Witnesses gave no help or cooperation to police and prosecutors throughout their investigations. During the trial, it came to light that evidence against Sewell dating back 20 years had been shredded by the organisation. And out of eight or nine elders who were involved in judicial hearings against Sewell following the abuse, only one agreed to give evidence in court, and even he attempted to retract his statement. The trial culminated in a guilty verdict for Sewell, who was imprisoned for 14 years on eight sex charges, including rape. Karen told the BBC that his abuse of her wasn't the only thing that had left her traumatised. Born and brought up as a Jehovah's Witness, the church was the family's life. And so, when the abuse began, it was to the church they turned. What Karen went through as a result, she now says is harder to deal with than the abuse itself. Those group of elders who sat me as a child in front of a guy who'd been abusing me for years and expected me to talk about it in front of him and hear him calling me a liar, I mean, I think that probably has had the most effect 
on the rest of my life because what Mark did to me, I've, I've had to try to deal with, but I've also had to try and deal with the fact that how the whole thing was handled. And it's that part of it that I'm just, I want answers for that. I caught up with Karen a few months ago and asked her about the case. She told me that though the elders had been quick to track her down and disfellowship her for having a normal relationship with her boyfriend after moving on from the witnesses, they were less eager to cleanse the congregation of a convicted pedophile. And the result was he got 14 years in prison. So he's done about a year of that now, but he's still a Jehovah's Witness in prison. He's um, doing Bible studies in prison. He's got elders visiting him from his old congregation, even though we've had no visit or nothing from anybody, no support, anything. Even my mum and my nan, who are still Jehovah's Witnesses, haven't had any... Well, they're anxious to take care of the spiritual welfare of the pedophile well, in their yeah, congregation. Well, obviously. <laughs> and, yeah. and they were quick to leap on you once there was a whiff of... Of, um, oh yeah, they um, came looking for me. They came looking for mm. you, for simply for you know, yeah, private yeah, intimate affairs with your boyfriend. But for a pedophile, well, you know, have other two witnesses and astonishing. I know it's, it's mm. crazy. Karen's father, John Viney, also gave an honest insight into why, as a Jehovah's Witness parent, he was not as quick to pursue justice for his daughter as he perhaps could have been. The process of being a Jehovah's Witness has a profound effect on you yeah. and it has an effect on you as a father um, and to a degree I think I'd have to be honest now and say that my children and my family didn't always come first right. because of um, either congregation responsibilities or trying to be loyal to what I believed. On some occasions, I think I was not as robust as protecting my children as I could have been. Mm. Having said that, um, when Karen first approached me, when she was about 12 or 13, and said that she didn't like the way her Uncle Mark was kissing her, that is what I thought she meant, mm. that she didn't like the way he was kissing her. I thought it was more perhaps the way he greeted her when we used to go around there he was uh, maybe too affectionate and that was the level of my understanding and I'm afraid the other anything else went completely over my head mm. even though she did tell me even again that she didn't like the way her uncle Mark was kissing her mm. um, so I was somewhat naive really and perhaps also didn't want to think of anything else although I actually don't believe at that time that I thought oh, something else might be going on mm. it was only when she was a teenager and was going through a difficult time, when she was first cutting her arms with some self-abuse, mm. that was the first time that the alarm bells went off and I thought, what on earth is going on here? Mm. And almost then, as a dad, you, you have to drop whatever you've got and mm. then you think, wow, I need, to, I need to pay attention to this. We now turn to another UK victim of child abuse within Jehovah's Witnesses, who we will refer to as Amelia. Between 1989 and 1994, when Amelia was between the ages of four and nine, she was abused by a ministerial servant named Peter Stewart. Shortly after the abuse began, Stewart was removed as a servant for abusing another child, but the elders allowed him to keep many of his privileges giving him free licence to continue abusing Amelia. The attacks took place in Amelia's home, in Stuart's home, in a shed and in cars. Stuart tormented Amelia, telling her that she was a sinner, telling her that she was guilty of fornication, telling her that she would die at Armageddon. In 1995, Stuart was convicted for assaulting another child and sent to prison for five years. When he was released, Amelia was terrified his abuse would continue, so she did two things. She contacted her elders and she contacted the police. The police took things very seriously and 72-year-old Stuart was arrested and charged, although he died in 2001 before the case came to trial. The elders, however, had little sympathy. 
They told Amelia that because there had not been two witnesses to her abuse, there was nothing they could do. At the urging of her husband, Amelia finally took legal action against Watchtower and her lawyers consulted with Candace Conti's lawyers back in America in bringing the case. Finally, in June 2015, the High Court ruled in Amelia's favour, making her the first person to win a civil suit against Watchtower in the UK. The BBC reported on the verdict. Today, Mr Justice Globe ruled that the Jehovah's Witnesses organisation was liable for the abuse carried out by Stuart and had failed to take sufficient safeguarding measures to protect Amelia. I think this should be a wake-up call to the Jehovah's Witness organization that they need to implement better child safeguarding policies that are in line with modern-day knowledge about child safeguarding and sexual abuse. Amelia received £275,000 in compensation, but nothing will ever fix the damage inflicted on her, not just by her abuser, but from those who shielded him from justice. She has already attempted suicide, and she once told her lawyers she doesn't expect to live beyond the age of 30. The final two victims we now turn our attention to are BCB and BCG. Both of these women gave testimony at the Australian Royal Commission and their ordeals illustrate the appalling inadequacy of Watchtower's child abuse policies when put into practice and how inconsistent elders can be when trusted to enforce them. BCB was raised on a farm in Western Australia. She started attending meetings at the age of 10 and was baptised at 18. From when she was 15 years old, BCB was groomed and sexually abused by an elder named Bill Neal, who was the father of one of her friends. Neal was one of only two elders in her congregation. The other was Max Hawley. Years later, when BCB, together with her husband, approached Max Hawley about the abuse, a meeting was arranged with the circuit overseer and Bill Neal. Astonishingly, Neil was brought into BCB's home by the elders for this all-male meeting. Neil was defiant and defensive and accused BCB of walking around his house wearing revealing clothing, a typical blame-the-victim routine. Max Hawley told the commission that even though he had no reason to disbelieve BCB's allegations, he was powerless to take action against Neil because there was no second witness to the abuse. Hawley later told BCB not to mention her abuse to anyone out of respect for Neil's family. He and the circuit overseer believed BCB enough to insist that Neil step down as an elder, but not enough to take judicial action against him or to inform the authorities. Once no longer an elder, Neil still had an active role in the congregation, and BCB was required to see him several times a week, including at meetings held at his house. In a letter to Watchtower, Hawley and the circuit overseer expressed that they would like Neil to serve as an elder again once this has died down. Exasperated by her treatment, by 2014 BCB had decided to take her accusations to the Royal Commission. An elder telephoned her husband and asked whether she really wanted to drag Jehovah's name through the mud. The same elder, Joe Bello, admitted before the commission that such coercion completely contradicted the organisation's own guidelines to never dissuade a victim from approaching the authorities. In giving evidence before the commission, BCB told of how her ordeal had changed her and affected her confidence. The abuse definitely changed who I was. It destroyed my confidence and my self-esteem. Even though the sexual abuse stopped when I was 19, I have continued to feel like Bill's victim well into my adult life. I've had a lot of therapy to address what Bill did to me, but I still have trouble feeling a sense of closure about what happened. I still feel that Bill was never made to face any consequences for what he did to me. I felt like Bill's position as an elder continued contributed to his power over me. Similarly traumatised by her experience was BCG from Queensland. When she was 17, her father sexually abused her multiple times over a two-week period, while the rest of her family were away on holiday. 
Shortly after the incident, BCG approached two elders in her congregation who happened to be friends with her father. She told the commission that both refused to speak to her until she confronted her father or unless her father was present at the meeting. It was eight months before a meeting was finally arranged between BCG and her elders at the insistence of her boyfriend. By that point, BCG's father was already being investigated by the elders for an extramarital relationship. But it would become clear that marital infidelity was of more pressing concern to the elders than a man's sexual assault of his teenage daughter. BCG was interviewed several times, again by an all-male tribunal. In one of these meetings, BCG's father was brought before her, making her feel terrified. She said he threatened her verbally and physically, and blamed her for seducing him. Around this time, BCG learned that her father had abused not only her, but her older sister and two younger sisters. She told the commission that when she told the elders of these new allegations, they refused to accept the testimony of her sisters, even though these should have been considered under the two-victim rule we discussed earlier. According to BCG, she was told by her elders that her sister's evidence could not be considered because they were too young to know what they were talking about and were not witnesses to the same event. All three elders told the commission that they didn't remember anything about these extra allegations concerning the abuse of BCG's sisters. I don't recall that. You know, that's, what that's... did you say to your wife? I'm unsure. I'll ask you again, what did you say to your wife? I am unsure. I can't remember that. That I cannot recall. Yeah, I cannot recall detail. So it's false what you've written here, isn't it? It wasn't one person's word against another. It's again in making that statement, that's that was my recollection. That I can't remember at all. I really have no memory of that. I can't recall. Uh, I can't remember. I have been trying to remember. I don't recall that phone call or that she brought that to my attention. You've said that already. I don't recall that at all. They also admitted that they believed BCG to be a genuine abuse victim, but said they were powerless to take action because they lacked sufficient evidence. But things began to unravel when one of the elders, Dino Ali, was shown notes that he had taken at the time of the investigation. These handwritten notes proved that the elders were aware of the allegations of abuse by BCG's sisters, one of whom was as young as two or three when she was first molested. The notes also revealed that BCG's father had confessed to assaulting her, meaning that the elders had all the grounds they needed to disfellowship him, not just under the two-victim rule, but under the two-witness rule. Amazingly, they didn't do that. Instead, they disfellowshiped someone they believed to be a pedophile, purely on the grounds of lying and loose conduct in an extramarital affair. Worse still, the elder's notes revealed that BCG was warned never to mention her abuse to anyone, not even her soon-to-be fiancé. Unsurprisingly, the horrendous treatment of BCG by her elders left her feeling vulnerable and even suicidal. She said it was only ever the authorities who took her seriously. At trial, my father denied all charges against him. It took six years and three trials before he was finally convicted for the indecent assault of me. The elders who presided over the committee meetings and the appeal committee meetings gave evidence at the committal and at a voir dire during the first trial, but the trial resulted in a hung jury. The second trial was declared a mistrial. My father was convicted at the third trial at the end of 2004. He was sentenced to three years imprisonment. The trials were easy compared to what I had been through with the elders during the committee meetings. I would go through it 20 more times if I had to. At least the court has rules 
when questioning survivor witnesses. The Jehovah's Witnesses can do and insinuate whatever they want and there are no protections for the victims at all. I've had no contact with any of the elders involved in the committee meetings or from the Mariba congregation or from the Watchtower since my father was convicted. During my teens, I was at times depressed and suicidal and this became worse after my father's sexual abuse of me while my mother was away at Expo 88. I also attempted suicide several months after the committee meetings in 1989. As a result of my experience of the committee meetings with the elders and I couldn't bear the judgment of those around me, the public vilification and ostracism. I wanted to dig a hole and die. The only time I felt my upset feelings were heard was when I went to the police. Nobody else up until that point had acknowledged that what my father did to me was wrong and he should be made to answer for it. I have at times lived a life in fear of being ostracised, shunned and vilified by those around me. I have always lived in fear of my father. I have lived in fear of Jehovah. I thought I had done all the right things. I had put my trust in Jehovah, but nobody protected me. They only made it worse. explained how Watchtower in Australia had been ordered to produce its records related to child abuse.